I'm your host, Amazing Rando, and welcome to Running Fate. Uh, this is a show about playing the Fate role-playing game. Uh, we have a heavy skew towards talking about our channel's main show, The Accords, where we play Dresden Files Accelerated, um, although I want to try and make that uh, make this show a little bit more broadly applicable to fate in general. Uh, I see a lot of questions on the Reddit, um, uh, on Reddit groups, um, subreddits, that's the word I'm looking for. I see a lot of questions posted to the subreddit, um, to the Facebook groups, and to the Google Plus community that I see. Um, and so like from time to time, I want to kind of uh, see what questions are out there prevailing and maybe address and answer some of those questions. Tonight, that's what I'm planning on doing. Um, but before I get to that, I just want to cover a little bit of ground um, for the channel that we have here. Um, first, I'm very happy to announce that we have launched our Patreon. Uh, so at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, you can see that we're at Patreon slash Polyhedral Crew. Um, so we are, if you enjoy the show, uh, either Running Fate or the Accords or anything else that we do, uh, please sign up to become a Patreon. Um, I'm working on adding some additional um, fun things for the uh, $5 and above level. Um, we have a $2 and above level, which gives access to the Discord um, uh, that we have uh, so that you can talk with us. Um, and we can chat and talk about any problems that you might have with fate or any interesting ideas that you have for the show. Um, so let's see. Um, Additionally, we recorded, um, not last week, but the week before, we recorded a one-off microscope game that has been posted to YouTube. So if you're interested in the microscope role-playing game, uh, I suggest that you go and check it out. Um, we did, uh, the four of us, um, John and Christopher and Amir, uh, we put together a world where a spaceship crashed uh, on a resource-starved planet, and we figured out how that society got back into the stars uh, many, many centuries later. It was a fascinating play. Uh, uh, go and check it out at YouTube slash Polyhedral Crew. Uh, and lastly, to help balance the holiday scheduling, uh, we are going to be running a one shot uh, coming up in December. Uh, I think it's the I think it's the uh, day before before the Christmas holiday. Uh, I, I can check the calendar, but we are going to be running Crystal Caper. Uh, Crystal Caper is a um, basically kind of like a magical pixie girl reskin of Honey Heist. So if you've enjoyed watching bears steal honey, um, come and watch us play magical girls uh, as we uh, pull off a Crystal Caper. So very, very excited about that. Uh, so let's talk about the uh, things that we've got going for tonight's game. Um, you can see off to the right, we've got, um, we're going to talk about how to start playing Fate. Um, I found that with the Adventure Zone diving their toe into Fate, um, that a lot of more, a lot more people are interested in it. I've seen like a lot of discussion again in all of those groups that I mentioned previously. Uh, people wanting to kind of figure it out, experiment with it. So I think I, I thought that I would talk a little bit about how to play Fate. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about core versus accelerated because usually whenever someone starts with fate, the next question that I see is, do I want core or do I want accelerated? Um, then I'm going to talk about having PCs of different power levels. Um, that was a question that uh, was submitted earlier today where how do you have people of, of varying degrees of power? Like how do you have like, you know, Wolverine and Superman in the same scenario and have them both uh, contribute meaningfully? And lastly, I'm going to talk about concessions uh, if we have time. If we don't, then I will definitely carry that over into the next Running Fate uh, so without further ado, I'd like to get into talking about uh, how to start playing Fate. Uh, I actually uh, wrote myself a bunch of notes this evening. Usually I do running Fate kind of uh, off of some bullet li bulleted lists from napkins, but I actually wrote a lot of stuff tonight that I'm trying to get through. Whew. So let's begin. So one of the, the things with Fate, the best way to actually learn the system is to play the system. Um, it reads really well, but it's something that you, you need to have kind of like a visceral reaction to. Like you, um, you can read about doing ballet, you can read about doing Kung Fu uh, and get an idea of what those stances and what those movements and things are. But until you actually start to do them, you don't understand it fully. And I think that Fate is the same way. Uh, and what I mean by this is that you, you have to actually immerse yourself into the game and you're going to stumble. It's okay. Um, 
it's uh, if you've played role playing games before that aren't as strongly narrative as Fate is, um, you're, you're going to stumble. Uh, I have a rich history of playing Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, I started on uh, AD and D Second Edition, played Third skipped fourth um then uh i've played a little bit of fifth edition I've, so i've played a lot of crunchy things pathfinder as well um and whenever i first started to learn to play fate whenever it first um i was gonna say whenever it first came out but that's not true it was when the kickstarter happened in 2014 that i first started to play fate uh it took me about a good six months of running games to get a handle on various balances and factors um and it feels like every session that i run i'm learning something new but it can take a little bit of time to kind of get through. Um, one of my recommendations if you're looking to play Fate is to try and get in with a group that already knows Fate. So what what how that's going to help is people are going to be able to tell you kind of the, the correct thing or the right thing, and so they'll be able to help guide you learn the system. So if it's possible, try and get uh, join up with a group at your local shop, uh, maybe at a convention uh, and games on demand, uh, or an online game. Um, uh, I have, uh, or we have here a show called the Accords where we run Dresden files. I try and talk through a lot of the things that we do in fate to try and make it instructive. Um, but, uh, you know, so hopefully you can learn from that as well. So, uh, let's see. Um, if you're running fate for the first time, if you're running it, so you're GMing it, my recommendation is that you make sure that your players understand um, that, that everybody's at the table to have fun and everyone there is to try something new and take risks. Pardon me. Uh, this helps set the stage that you're going to have a fun game night and that uh, getting the rules right aren't as important as getting the feel for the game right, getting the flow right, making sure that like fate points feel like they're going back and forth the way that they should, making sure that whenever you're creating aspects, they're interesting, uh, making sure that compels are interesting as well, and focusing on making sure that the game itself feels well. When trouble comes up in a fate game, uh, err on the side of a cool story that favors the heroes. So if it makes the game more interesting uh, and err on the side of making sure that the players uh, feel rewarded. Um, I know as a GM, sometimes we can hold our plot sacred and our bad guys sacred. Um, uh, don't hold them sacred. Just, you know, kind of err on the side of like, cool story, bro, and uh, move on with it. After the game, after you're done running the game, um, I suggest that you re review whatever trouble spots that you had or um, uh, just kind of take notes during the game and then compare and contrast that with the rules to see if there was something that you did wrong. Uh, that was something that I did whenever I was learning Fate is that I would be like, so uh, I would come back to them at you know, the next gaming session and be like, so guys, uh, concessions, that bad guy that conceded, we did that completely wrong. Uh, it should have been like this instead of like that. Next time we'll do it correctly, but I wanted to make sure that everybody knew. And so being open and communicative um, is good for playing Fate for the first time. Um, and expect to, to stumble a little bit, uh, but you'll get stronger as you move forward with it. So that's, um, that's kind of like my quick thoughts on uh, how to start playing Fate, which is to, to basically like just get started. And when someone gets started playing Fate, um, the question that comes up then is, do I play Fate Core or do I play Fate Accelerated? Um, uh, which leads us into our second topic, which is Core versus Accelerated. Which, um, I, eh, Core versus Accelerated is actually a lie. It's not, uh, it's a false demarcation. Um, they're both the same system. The difference is, is that within that system that there are a bunch of little dials that you can tweak. Um, uh, this is uh, this is a question that comes up um, pretty awesome or pretty often, and so I thought that I would address this. Which um, so a lot of the role playing games that you'll play are like are set in stone with a few optional tweaks. So like Thirteenth Age, for instance, uh, has a bunch of sidebars where you can modify things. Or um, for instance, the two authors will have different rulings on how something should happen, like recharging abilities, whether that should happen at the end of every session or happen at every uh, like major like milestone. And it says basically like you're the GM, pick one and go with it. And you have those small little tweaks that you can make to the game. But generally, the hardcore, most of it is set in stone. The difference here is that uh, with Fate, Fate is really a, an RPG toolkit. 
That, that is what it is at its, at its absolute core is that fate is a toolkit to build out um, a structure that fits your narrative, which is part of the reason why I like fate so much, because it means that I can build exactly what I want in a very, very easy manner. So, so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, part so let's talk about that a little bit. I want to talk about, um, you know, so fate, like what, like what's the minimum that you need to run fate? Uh, the minimum that you need to run fate uh, are fate points and aspects. That is like the bare minimum. I've never actually run a game like that. Um, I don't know how interesting it would be, but um, it, it would depend on the people involved. But basically fate points to be able to get benefits and aspects to be able to give narrative permission for things and to define things. That's really kind of the minimum that you need. You don't need stress tracks, you don't need conditions. Um, you can use aspects as or conditions. Uh, whenever I say conditions, uh, yeah, conditions, not consequences. Yeah, you, can, you don't need conditions, but um, you can keep consequences, which are aspects. So basically fate points and aspects are literally the minimum that you need to run. Um, so, Let's talk about uh, let's talk about dice rolls, um, okay? And let's talk about how that works out. Um, uh, so, um, oh, let's see. Sorry, I got a little bit discombobulated. Uh, but so, fate points and aspects and everything else are dials to be tweaked for your preferred style of play. Uh, so let's talk about dice rolls. You can use the default skill list. So you've got physique, you've got uh, um, rapport, you've got notice, you have all of these different skills that are set and defined, um, and you can use them out of the box in just about any genre that you'd like to play. Depending on the narrative that you want to set forth, you could tweak those. Like maybe drive is called ride instead because it's horses instead of cars. Well, you've made a, a just a, um, a small little change to it, uh, and you've customized it for your fantasy adventure. Um, you can also tweak it even more. You can start, um, you can add a skill like medicine if you want to, if that's a very important element of your game. Um, you can also do what I do, which is I remove notice from all of my games uh, because I find that players rely too heavily on notice and perception-based skills. Uh, they use them as shortcuts for figuring out clues. Um, I'm the kind of GM that I like to, I like to I like to describe things. I like to give my players clues and have them figure things out and shortcutting it with a notice or a perception based skill. Um, I think, uh, it isn't something that I want in my games. Um, and so I, I remove it. Um, and I talk to my players about it to make sure they know, uh, and everything is good. Um, now, if you're not a fan of skills, or maybe you want to try something different, you could use approaches. Um, so Fate Accelerated and Dresden Files Accelerated both use approaches instead of skills. Well, skills being, um, you know, things that your character knows, and approaches being how your character solves problems. Uh, so with approaches, it's, it's you know, Tony Stark is a very flashy guy, so the flashy approach is probably going to be his highest ranked one, and he's going to use that a lot. Um, this is not a surprise. Uh, players, whenever they build characters, will make use of their highest level skills all the time, so it's not a problem. So you have skills or approaches. That's a dial you can turn in Fate. Um, now, if you're particularly daring, you can actually remove all of the skills and have no approaches and just give bonuses to a role based on the relevant aspects that the character has. So, for instance, there is a world of adventure called Three Rocketeers, and in Three Rocketeers, there are no skills and there are no approaches. Whenever you go to do something, you um, say, this aspect applies, and you get a plus one bonus to the role. Um, now, the, the player characters are Rocketeers, so they get a flat plus two to all of their roles, and then they add those aspect bonuses on top of that. So what that means is, is that just in skills alone, so skills approaches, no skills, um, we have a, a dial that we can turn as we see fit. Like maybe we want everything to be aspect based. Uh, maybe we want it to be more about what a character knows, or we want it to be how a character approaches things. Um, so fate, again, going back to that idea that fate as a toolkit is that you have all of these different dials. Um, and so this sort of feeds into like the idea of what's the difference between fate accelerated and fate core. The, the difference is just where those dials are set. Um, so a, a, another big kind of divergence between core and accelerated is how stress is handled. And with stress, um, 
Core has two stress tracks. It has mental and it has physical. Um, and you absorb stress on those tracks and you also have um, consequences, mild, moderate, and severe. Fate Accelerated has the same consequences, mild, moderate, and severe, but it only has one stress track. Um, and that one stress track will absorb stress from any source, whether it's mental, physical, social, wealth, whatever different kinds of um, attack uh, attacks you have. Um, and then, so you have these two different dials where you have a couple of different stress tracks. Um, and then there's Dresden Files Accelerated, pardon, uh, Dresden Files Accelerated, uh, skip stress entirely uh, and makes use of conditions, which are check boxes that say that like whenever you take stress, check this box to um, to uh, absorb a certain amount of stress. Like the imperil condition, you check it to absorb, um, I believe it's four points of stress um, and you gain a an aspect that, um, that ties into that condition to represent the source of that condition. Um, so here again, we've got three different options um, that you can turn your dial and make it what you want it. Um, so, uh, so if you, uh, let me, th sorry. Um, so basically all of this is to say that all fate games are fate. They just have dials turned in different ways that reinforce the story that you're trying to tell. Um, so if you aren't sure which dials to turn or how to modify the system, Start with something that feels right and workshop it until you get the right feel. So, for instance, maybe um, maybe you're playing Dresden Files Accelerated and you're using the approaches from the book. Uh, after a couple of sessions, maybe the approaches just feel like they aren't working for the players. Um, or you maybe you just ha like having situations where the players don't have the right skills to get out of the situation. Um, it is perfectly acceptable in the game to 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 talk to the players between sessions, not in the middle of a session, and to kind of tell them like, hey guys, this this uh, this notch on the dial isn't working for our game. Let's let's switch it to another thing. Let's um, you know let's remove all skills and use aspects as bonuses, or let's start using approaches. Or there's a uh, a lot of different dials that can be turned, and and sometimes you know that going into it. Like I've run Fate games um, since the Fate Core Kickstarter, um, just about um, you know probably every other week since then, um, maybe more. And so, like, you know, I've got a good sense of what dials I like to have turned for different feels, but you have to play in order to, to kind of gain that sense. And so it's okay to change that as you're actually playing the game. So that's a little bit about core versus accelerated. To just summarize again, uh, it's a, a false dichotomy. It, they're the same game, just with dials turned in different ways. Oh, so let's see. Um, what do we want to talk about next? So... The next thing that I'd like to talk about is talking about characters of different power levels um, in the same scene or in the same group. Okay, um, so Fate is built with the idea that all player characters can contribute to the game. Um, in fact, um, so when when the original Dresden Files game came out, um, I was super obsessed with it because I'm a big Dresden Files fan. And so I'm like, why did they choose Fate? I don't understand. That doesn't make any sense. Um, at the time, I was running a True 20 game, and uh, it was my latest, greatest. It was it was my current favorite. And so I was looking to find out, like, what were they what were they thinking of doing? And the articles that I read said that they were uh, that it was actually down between True 20 and Fate. Now, bear in mind, this is me reciting back to you what I read in an article years ago. So whether or not this proves to ultimately be true or not, I don't know. But uh, the reason that they went with Fate over something like True 20 or D20 based is that um, is being able to contribute no matter who your character is. So they wanted to make sure that the pizza delivery person and the big wizard in the same scene were both contributing to the battle. Like they didn't want to have that issue where... Um, you had the first level character and a 20th level character in the same scene and either the 20th level character blows everything away or the first level character gets blown away. Uh, they wanted to make sure that everyone could contribute. And that's one of the things that fate does really well. So like, you know, sure, uh, the sorcerer can cast lightning bolt that creates the aspect slow on the iron golem, but it's the research assistant who found out about the weakness that helped unlock that guidance. And so like what we have to do is we have to set up these scenes so that um, so that things work, things work out better. So 
Uh, we know that mechanically, all of the characters have the same power level. Um, the as uh, the so they have the same bonuses to skills, like they have the same like apex skill or approach, uh, and um, and they have like the same number of stunts. Like generally, they're built the same. Um, Dresden Files accelerated. There's a little bit of unevenness in the mantles, which is intentional, but that's it's still fine because like. If I had a chance to play Dresden Files, I would pick one of the mortal mantles because I think that fits with my play style really well and would ultimately prove to be pretty awesome. But setting that aside, um, uh, aspects on characters give different permissions to how they can solve problems. So um, so what this means is like, uh, so let's see. Okay, so, so let's say you have a pizza delivery person and Thor, the god of thunder, trying to stop Loki. Um, obviously in this particular scene, the pizza delivery person is not, not a key individual to defeat of Loki. Maybe like, you know, he's just kind of on the scene there for laughs or maybe to help out a little bit, but it's obviously a big showdown between Thor and Loki. Um, and so, um, so they each, so Thor and the pizza delivery person both have to use their permissions from aspects to try and solve problems. So Thor's maybe throwing lightning bolts, throwing his hammer. Um, uh, but the, uh, the pizza delivery person can still contribute to the combat. And the way that they can do that is they can you make use of create advantage and overcome roles to distract Loki and generally be a nuisance. Maybe the pizza delivery guy is like throwing pizzas at Loki and Loki puts his arm up to block a pizza and Thor's hammer hits him in the face. Um, and so this pizza delivery person maybe like notices that there's like something uneven about the floor and is able to throw a switch that knocks Loki off balance. Again, like using your imagination and creating advantage uh, or overcoming challenges like, you know, shutting down the device that creates a force bubble around Loki or something like that. Um, whereas, uh, you know, Thor is probably going to be the one to pelt Loki to take him out. Um, but the pizza delivery person can contribute meaningfully to the fight and in an interesting way, because you can tell the narrative, you know, uh, from an interesting point of view. So now let's, let's take a moment with that and let's explore another scene with the same characters. Well, at least Thor and our pizza delivery person. Maybe the pizza delivery person is a player character who's actually getting their master's and master's degree in physics. Um, and this person and Thor are trying to figure out how to reopen a gate to Asgard. Suddenly, our scene is switched. So instead of Thor being the badass in this scene, it's actually our pizza delivery person who is going for their master's degree in physics that is the badass in the scene. So uh, Thor can help by giving this person some insight, like into like Asgardian thinking, uh, with a little bit of create advantage. Um, but at the end of the day, this is a problem that only our pizza delivery person can solve using their abilities, um, and so. What this means is that just because there is a like differentiating power levels between characters in a party, um, it doesn't mean that um, one is going to automatically outshine another. Um, you want to make sure that when you have PCs with varying power levels like this, uh, that you craft challenges that allow each of them to shine in turn. So like, you know, you want to make sure that uh, the player playing Thor gets to like, you know, shoot lightning and hit things with its hammer. You want to make sure that the pizza delivery person is, uh, you know, who's studying physics is able to use that knowledge that they're gaining. And you want to make sure that, um, that when a player isn't in the spotlight, that they can still contribute to the scene somehow meaningfully. Um, so that's that's kind of part of um, playing different power levels. That's how that kind of works. So uh, let's see. So I am working my way through here. I've got, um, let's see, three of my four topic items. If anybody has anything that they'd like to, to talk about, uh, please feel free to post it in the chat. Um, and I will be happy to answer it uh, after I talk about a little bit about concessions. So um, concessions. Um, concessions have come up recently on some of the fate boards um, talking about how to uh, how a either a bad guy can concede or how a player character can concede in a way that's meaningful uh, and interesting and has the appropriate sense of loss. So. First, I want to define what a concession is. 
um, a concession and fate is where um, you're in a conflict. Okay, so um, that conflict can be physical, social, mental, whatever it is, it's a conflict. And the goal of the conflict is for one side to take out another side. Um, and um, if, a, if a person gets taken out, the, okay, so if um, one side takes out the other side, um, the aggressor gets to choose the fate of the person taken out. So what that means is that like, um, so I'm running a private game and um, usually my bad guys, they don't all want to have the, the heroes dead. Sometimes they just want them out of the way or something along those lines. So if I have like a collection of thugs going up against the PCs and one of the PCs is about to be taken out, um, the, um, or, or is taken out, if they are taken out, then maybe it's a case of um, they lose some gear or um, something, I have something embarrassing happen to them uh, along those lines. Um, so they, um, it, the goals of the aggressor in that instance aren't to kill, it's to just kind of like stop them. And sometimes it's that simple. Sometimes it's just, well, you got taken out. We're going to fill up all of your consequences as they, uh, they took you out pretty bad. And, um, that's about it. You just have to spend the time recovering from the consequences that you've gained from being taken out. Uh, other times, um, so again, in a private game that I was playing, uh, I had a character who was playing an, an anthropomorphic elephant. Um, it makes sense in the game. Uh, so um, let's see. Okay, so he's playing an anthropomorphic elephant. Uh, and his character has uh, one tusk. So one of the other tusks were broken off a long time ago. There's a story behind it and has one tusk remaining. It's, this character, is PC, is fighting another bad guy. And this bad guy um, is out to kill this player character uh, for, for very strong reasons. And uh, if that bad guy wins the fight then what happens? It takes out the PC. What's going to happen is that PC is going to die. Um, now, I as a GM usually clearly communicate that to my heroes because uh, player character death is something to be taken very seriously. Um, and so in any fight that involved this particular character, um, I said that I, I explicitly said death was on the line. Um, and so this made the, the player who's playing the, the elephant decide, I'm going to concede after taking a bunch of consequences, but decided I'm going to concede because I know what's going to happen if I lose. And the concession needed to take them out, but it had to be meaningful. Um, and what we decided was that the, uh, the bad guy was actually going to manage to break off the other tusk from the elephant um, and get to keep that kind of like as a trophy from the fight. And so this concession basically um, made, like, it was really powerful. It was definitely a good decision on, um, on, on what a loss would be in this situation. Uh, and it felt, it felt appropriate. Um, so one of the things with concessions is that you want to make sure that there is a, um, a feeling of loss. Like a concession is not a get out of jail free card. Um, it's just saying, I want to avoid the worst of my fate. Um, and you need to negotiate that with your players to find out what is okay and what is not okay for that. Um, sometimes like in the aforementioned instance of the, the elephant player, um, you know, maiming, taking the tusk off was, was on the line In other instances, it might be something that's a little bit, um, not as, not as physically oriented. So let's say the players are at a party, they're at a ball, um, and they get themselves involved in a social conflict. Uh, the politicians of the party are very adept at this sort of thing. The player characters are not, and one of the players gets taken out. Um, maybe uh, what happens uh, as a result of that? A like, if the um, if the player concedes, um, maybe uh, what happens is that uh, the player character is turned into like a, a social pariah um, and is. Um, uh, no inns in town will will put the player up. 
Um, and so like as a result of this, the player has to figure out where they're going to bed down while they're in town. Um, and so they've got to either like sleep out in the woods or do something else. And so like they, this is like a, uh, you know, big, big thing. Um, whereas had they not conceded and been taken out, maybe the local politicians would have just, uh, exiled them from town. Like just told them like, listen, you have to leave and never come back. Goodbye. Um, so let's see. So that's, that's a little bit about concessions. Um, they, they are somewhat tricky because you want to make sure that there is a good loss, a good strong, it should sting, uh, but it should also avoid like some of the, the worst uh, of it. Um, usually as a GM, having a good idea of what the bad guys want and what they're willing to accept uh, is kind of a good thing. Um, I, I prescribe to the idea that whenever you're running a conflict uh, between, uh, between the bad guys and the heroes, that the bad guy has uh, motivations that make a lot of sense. Um, like, for instance, whenever I have random thugs uh, attack the players, I, I, they're very rarely random thugs, but um, we all know those sorts of encounters that are sort of just a, a little bit more filler than others. Uh, I try and make it meaningful in some way. Like maybe there's a reason why the uh, the dock workers are attacking um, the the player characters, and uh, I give them like maybe their agenda isn't is just to harass them to leave town. Like being taken out means that the player characters are going to like be taken to the edge of town and dropped off and uh, basically like you know told never to come back. And maybe the um, a concession in that instance might be that as long as the player characters uh, keep quiet and keep to themselves and don't stir up trouble, and well, that see that, that's a little bit weak. Uh, maybe if the um, players end up like paying off the dock workers, doing them a favor, um, or or something uh, something else, a little bit harsh. Um, like maybe the players only suddenly have like one day that they can stay in the city as a result of the concession. Um, and so they've got to make quick work of whatever they, they formerly had leisure time to do. Uh, so I hope that, I hope that helped with concessions. Um, uh, so I'm looking at the chat room and I don't see any questions. Um, I'm going to just refresh the browser to see if maybe, maybe I missed some, if that's not the case, then uh, I think that, yep. None there. All right. So, uh, so that really wraps us up for tonight for, uh, for running fate. Uh, tonight we talked about how to start playing fate. Uh, we talked about, uh, core versus accelerated. We talked about different power levels and, uh, we also talked about concessions. Um, thank you very much for joining us on running fate. Uh, I was your host, amazing rando. Uh, and, uh, as always happy gaming. Thank you so much. Bye.